Welcome to the ID10T podcast number 1094. Let's jump right in with you, the ID10T community, on the ID10T community corkboard events at ID10T.com. Like Sam, who writes, last year I started a YouTube channel with my brother, heavily inspired by your podcast. Sam, that's very nice. Thank you very much. The channel is called Total Scenario and includes my very own podcast called Face to Face, a series of top 10 videos, a football style knockout competition that started with 92 movies called The Movie Mega Cup, a music show called Three Songs Each, gaming videos, and more. The idea is that music, movies, and gaming together is the best kind of scenario. It kind of doesn't make sense, but it's a lot of fun. Sam, that's a great idea. And you know what makes sense about it? You make sense about it. You pull all those things together. And damn it, that is perfectly the theme of this podcast today. Um, The idea of making an original thing that you're sort of the center of the pinwheel of things that may on paper seem disparate, but you are the connective tissue. And that's something that we talk about today in the podcast. So beautifully timed, Sam. Beautifully timed. Um, This episode is Chase Morrill, who hosts a show that Lydia and I absolutely love called Maine Cabin Masters. It's on the DIY network. Um, By the way, it's Maine, the state of Maine. Not Maine as in the main thing. It's Maine, the state of Maine, M-A-I-N-E. And you know we love home renovation. And it's such an inventive uh, reno show. It's just a family. It's friends and family of Mainers who just restore these cabins that they call camps. And they use a lot of recycled materials. Uh, Chase has a salvage yard. He donates a lot of his own stuff. And they do these incredibly creative renovations for literally almost no money. And they're stunning. I mean, they just do such amazing work. And again, they pull together all these different pieces and uh, create the sort of the identity and the aesthetic of the camp, which in a lot of cases are passed down from generations there within families. And so they incorporate a lot of that. And the story, each story of each camp is really amazing. And then they're just really funny as a group. They just have a great dynamic. They're really funny, and uh, and we love watching it. And actually, the thing that I'm bummed about is that we're super, we're all caught up, so we're we're actually out of new episodes to watch. So Lydia and I at night, when we're getting into bed, we just put on episodes we've already seen and go, "Oh yeah, that's right, they did this one thing." We love the show so 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 much. And Chase was great. This was a super fun podcast. And we also because it's DIY, you know, we talk a lot about what can you do if you're. You know, especially if because of the pandemic, if you're stuck at home, if there are home projects, renovation projects that you're thinking about doing, you know, to maybe figure out, give it a try yourself, watch some YouTube videos. Obviously, I would not recommend tackling anything electrical or plumbing. You should bring in professionals for that. But, you know, if you're talking about like cabinet building or building furniture or like changing paint colors or whatever or wallpaper, you know, those are definitely things that I think you could enjoy learning. And what a sense of accomplishment you'll have. So um, that's it. Uh, Oh, one small correction. In the very beginning, Chase says, oh, have you been to Maine? And I go, no, I've never been to Maine. And then afterwards, I realized I'm stupid I have absolutely been to Maine and performed at the State Theater in Portland. So I apologize, Portland, Maine. I don't know why. I just, for it was a while ago, it was a handful of years ago, and uh, I've pretty much, I've forgotten, <laughs> I've forgotten all the places that I've been because I've traveled a lot. In any case, I have been to Maine. My deepest apologies. And uh, now let us begin the ID20 podcast number 1094 with Chase Morrill of Maine Cabin Masters. Initiating ID10T protocol. So first of all, let me just preface this by saying my wife and I have seen every episode of Main Cabin Masters. We Hi. love it. Um, Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're like, you know, we're amateur house. Like we restore, like we like to restore historical homes. And so we sort of do that as for, for you know, like we'd like to, <laughs> like to restore. 
And uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so about a month ago, I was just sort of surfing through. It was like we need a new like you know we need a new couples show to watch together. Yeah. And they go main cabin masters. This looks really interesting. And within the first episode, we were like, holy fuck, this is the best. And <laughs> binged all five seasons and are now fully caught up. Right on, right on, right on. Have you ever been to Maine? No, it's one of the like three states I've never been to. Yeah. Well, you uh, come and, on but over. now we want to go. Like Lydia, yeah, yeah. when we watch the show, she goes, God, I never, I got, she goes, I really want to go to Maine now. So it actually makes us want to go visit Maine. Well, fantastic. Then I'd say that call that a success. How did I just, just because I, I've because we watched the we binge watched the show all at once, I really got to see the arc of the show. I really got to see the, the like the evolution of the series. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and how how did they find you? Did you find DIY? Like, I just I want to really figure out like how this all how this all happened. So it's really, I mean, dumb luck is the best way to describe it. My daughter's friend's mother worked for a local land trust organization and Dorsey Pictures out of Colorado was, were, you know, reaching out, trying to, they knew that Alaska was really hot. They wanted to do something more wilderness across country. They were looking for carpenters in Maine who did, you know, worked on this type of project. And we did a pilot originally for the History Channel. Okay. And it, it was kind of split between Alaska and Maine. And it wasn't really what the History Channel was looking for at the time. So they, Dorsey Pictures was like, well, we'd like to do something with you anyways. And, you know, we kind of came up with this other format. We did a few Skype interviews down in the basement of an apartment building I owned. You know, we all had our beards and had the accent. And they're like, oh, this is great. (laughs) And, you know, then it kind of took off. We thought we would do one, you know, one pilot episode, have great stories to tell. And that would be it. But it's kind of just continued on. And. I think we've done almost 70 cabins now, which is it's crazy. And well, it, it, I mean, it's so crazy. First and foremost. So there's so many things, so many questions that I have. <laughs> I mean, legitimately my wife are super fans of your show. Like even just hearing you talk to me, I feel like yeah. I'm watching the show because I'm so used to <laughs> listening to your voice. That's so strange. Describe how you're going to put spray foam insulation. Like it just yeah, yeah. literally So next we're going to, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here's the, so there's a lot of questions that I have, but first of all, um, the, the managing all the cabins and just for people who don't know, basically um, camps are what the cabins are and they're, they're called camps, but they're basically like, I don't want to say they're like a step above trailers, but they're like not, they don't all necessarily have like concrete foundations. They're sort of like set on pylons almost. They're like, it it can be anything really. And that's, you know, we try to get that across. Like, and up in Maine, we call them camps. You know, a lot of people think that camp is like going to a summer camp with all boys or tent tent or something like that. But up here, we call them camps. You go up to camp and it can be a tent platform it can be, you know, a million dollar state on the coast. Or it can be your favorite campground. It can be an RV parked in place, or it can be a log cabin your grandfather built, or you and your buddies built in the middle of the woods, or on a lake, on a stream. So, and that's just it. There's so many of them across Maine, and they, it's so many different forms that, you know, not all of them are built perfectly. They can be built on logs. They can be built on just the ground. But yeah, because someone's grandfather was like. We need a vacation home. Fuck it. I'm just going to put some logs up. And then they, they, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They and thought, they, you and know, they be like, oh, we're going to have this weekend. We're yeah. going to drink some beers and build a new addition on the place. <laughs> and over the years, you know, it just kind of evolves. And that's where we come in. It's like they get to a point where, okay, these places are too far gone or need help above and beyond what the camp owner can do. And that's when we step in. And the worse condition, the better it is for us. Yeah, but that's what's so amazing about it is that because, and I wasn't aware that Maine had this section where there's just all these like fingerlit aisles and they all have all these little camps on them. But the thing that's so great about it is that they all, they all have stories and you can see this sort of like stratified history in, yeah. oh, my grandfather, and then they added this and then they added this and the roofs don't line up because they put this part here and they just built on and and so you really are kind of like you're you're kind of like excavating and getting this this construction diary of someone's family history 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then representing it to them like, okay, now this should last another hundred years. And that part is, it's, it's like, it's, it, it really is like a big part of the heart of the show, I think. Oh, for sure. I mean, because we're, you know, it's me, my, my sister, my brother-in-law, good buddies we've grown up with, all family and friends. We're all from Maine. We've all, we all have these camps or have had access to them. When the camp owners reach out to us, it's because, A, they don't want to tear it down and start fresh because there's too many memories that would be lost. Or, you know, or the contractor, other contractors said, hey, you know, tear it down, start fresh. We step in and we say, no, that's still salvageable. You yeah. know, and people want to preserve those memories and it's doable. It's not going to be a perfect brand new camp. It's still going to be rough around the edges, but we can make it usable as best as we can to keep the tradition going. Well, you, I mean, you all do such amazing work and we're constantly jealous of, you know, because the average renovation budget is like 25 grand. Yes. And it, there's some <laughs> variation. The highest we've ever seen, we just saw an episode where the guy had 50, but he had to kick it up another 20 because the house was just a fucking disaster. And it's the only time I've ever seen you go to someone and go, we actually need a little more money because we have to rip everything down. It's just that there are too many layers. And that's the most I've ever seen anyone spend on that show. And otherwise, it's like 10 weeks, 25 grand. Like, how are they doing this in 10 <laughs> weeks for $25,000? Like, what is the secret wizardry that you're using to accomplish this? We get, we get that question all the time. People are like, there's no way, there's no way, there's no way. But the amount you see on the show is what the camp owner puts into it. Of course, there's some incentive from production side of things. You know, there's a little bit extra for landscaping budget for the design sure. budget. But it's amazing how much you can save when you don't have the camp owner right there. You know, because they hand us the keys and they leave. They, you know, we get a good idea of what they're looking for. But we get from point A to point B. However, the building or the path of least resistance, right. how it makes the most sense for the building versus right. saying, okay, we want this addition this way. We'll say, okay, it makes the most sense to have the addition on this part of the camp where it's going to save the least amount of money. And we can then go and say to our local lumberyard, what do you have for windows that we can use in this space versus saying we're using this size windows? You know, there's, there's definitely tricks to understood. The you're basically, yeah, because you're working with such low budgets, it's sort of like, well, you take what you get. And, and I think that is also such a wonderful life metaphor, too, of like, Oh, yeah. This is going to be really special because we're just going to allow these elements to happen and we're just going to make them work. Yes. And it, it, don't, it is still rough around the edges. I mean, it's camp. You know, it's a place that you want to go make memories. You don't care if the floor gets scuffed up or you drop a beer on the floor. I mean, it is it's a place you want to go and hang out. And that's what's most important to us. And that's what we try and, you know, convey to the camp owners as well. My wife pointed this out the other day. She was like, you know what I love about Chase is that he... Because you, you know, for people who haven't seen the show, and I, I don't even think the audience has even seen a fraction. I think we've only seen the tip of the iceberg. You have this like insane salvage yard of stuff where it looks like Chase doesn't throw anything away. He keeps anything that she said. He, it looks like he keeps anything that might be useful for another camp. And then you, you all like donate stuff that you have in your yard. Like, oh, I had this old stove or I had this you know, Dixie had this stove in his basement, so we put it in the thing, or I had this window and we put it in the thing, that you have this collection pile of stuff that you're constantly recycling and upcycling. Constantly, constantly. I mean, I've got a couple of toilets out in my dooryard across the street from my house that, you know, if we need a toilet in a camp and, you know, the budget isn't there, it's a working toilet, I have no problem putting that in another camp. Um. <laughs> Which is good because it almost, you're like, you're you're it's almost like hoarder adjacent but there's a cons, there's a constructive element it's, it's a it. fine line i agree with you it's a very fine line <laughs> and i because of the show i think i probably gather a lot more than i normally would yeah but i but i also try and use it as much as i possibly can like all the guys know to ask me first for stuff before they go out and buy new, which again, it's, you know, if it still has life left in it, why not reuse it? If I can save the camp owner's budget and stretch it that much further, it's just going to give them that much more of a finished, uh, you know, quality end product. But watching you navigate the piles, like I know there was a thing underneath <laughs> and, and Lydia's like, how the fuck is he going to get under that pile? And then you lift it up, you lift up like five layers of, 
what looks like a ton of scrap metal. It's like, oh yeah, here's this transom that I knew was <laughs> under. Like, how did he know that that was there? It's almost like you have this weird sense of. Oh, it's like, yeah, it's the, it's the sense of sickness. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a fine line. <laughs> but my father was my father was worse, you know. Same way he he's there's still a barn or a garage full at my mother's house of stuff that I pull out from his collection. I've got stuff stored in my mother in law's garage. Like it's definitely an expanse, and people people have started dropping stuff off at my barn. Just like oh, Chase, you'll use this, so it, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> Do you, I, and the the shop that y'all opened. Are you selling? Um, are you selling like salvaged goods and like a refreshed salvaged stuff, or is it is it just basically? You right know, now, like, the shop is kind of like merchandise from the show, but right. also artists that Ashley's worked with. Yeah, um, we've got a lot of display pieces that were salvaged. I hoped, you know, and I hope to get to the point where I can start, you know, bringing in material, being like, hey, you know, six pane old six pane windows. I've got too many to even store at this point. It's like, all right, I need to start selling them or they're just going to sit across the street and rot out. So, yeah, well, the salvage business, at least in America has, I've, because we've been doing this for, I don't know, a handful of years, maybe six or seven years. I've been like rehabbing places and yeah, I've seen like my go-tos for getting good salvage. Like I see the prices tick up every year. I'm like, oh, now this is a thing. (laughs) <laughs> now it's like, you know, a shitty old window, if it's on like first dibs or something like $3,800, are you fucking kidding me? You know? Oh, absolutely. You know, the older, the more beat up it is, the more, the more the price goes up. Yeah. But that's, but, that, but so that's a good point too, is like all these things that they're quality, they're made out of real wood. So we try and use as much real wood as possible so that down the road, the same thing, you know, this, we, we see that the stuff will last. So we try to build with quality products to again start those stories fresh for everybody. Yeah, because there, there are you know there is a real industry now around basically like salvage scavenge hunters who oh, will huge. get a line on oh this you know this church in Oklahoma is about to be torn down and they'll go in and like take out the pews and pull out the this and the stained glass and then all of a sudden you know and you're paying for the they're they're basically their effort of going to Oklahoma right, 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 and right, right, bringing right, right, it right. back. But it still has gone from things that, you know, like maybe six, seven years ago might have been like 500 bucks or like $3,000 now. It's a real, it, salvage has become a real industry, but almost all of our stuff is either antique or salvage because we like the recycling aspect and, and it just, anything with a story is more interesting than something that got, yeah. you know. It almost, yeah, it's got a soul to it of sorts, you know, yeah. and that's the same thing with the camps. You can tear down and build new, but that soul, it's hard to rebuild and recreate. Whereas if you renovate and retrofit, you're going to retain as much of that as possible. And that's what people really do want at camps. You know, they want to go in where their grandfather swam and fished and that type of stuff. They want to be able to recreate those memories with their kids and continue the tradition. Was this your dad's business or was he a hobbyist? Was it? Uh, He, it was just in his blood, you know, same thing with my grandparents. They dragged in their original camp was an old army barracks from the local naval air station that they were, you know, the government was getting rid of. They dragged it up to the property, built that. It just, you know, it's just one of those things that we've always done. So it's second nature to me, which I'm hopefully passing on to my kids. A couple of my son, you know, he's become a little bit of a hoarder. My couple of my daughters absolutely don't want anything to do with it. but. <laughs> Sorry. You know, they're going to get to be adults and they're going to live in the most minimalist, like, you know, someone's going to bring a coffee pot and they're like, get that out of oh, here. Yeah, yeah. I don't Perfectly white house, all glass, no yeah. furniture, anything like that. <laughs> but yeah, sometimes I feel sorry for what they'll inherit, but who knows if the piles will still here, be here by then. No, it's great though, because it, 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 I think what it does ultimately train you for, certainly train kids for is resourcefulness and for, for, for kids to really learn a skill set with their hands is not the most common thing in our culture now. So to be able to, I mean, I'm so jealous that, I mean, just like watch you guys just cut wood at 45 degree angles or just like handsaw something and it's perfect. It's like, yeah, that was years of craft. And, and uh, I feel like I'm too old now to learn how to do any of that, but I, I have such respect for it. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree totally. We've got, I think my nephew, one of Ryan's nephews, one of Dixie's nephews, they're all in high school right now and they're working with us this summer. 
And it's the greatest thing just to have them around, be, you know, get them swinging hammers, get them using the power tools. So it's kind of second nature for them. So they ha- always have that skill in their pocket or something to fall back on. Cause that's, that's kind of how a lot of us ended up in it. So we want to, again, same thing. We want to kind of carry that tradition on as well. Did you go to, did you go to school for it or was it just sort of an eight? Because you obviously have a really strong understanding of the engineering and the math. Yeah. So I, a lot of my family, my aunts and uncles were, you know, teachers or engineers. Um, I went to a liberal arts school in Bar Harbor. So I didn't, you know, my focus wasn't really on that. But again, it's something that we always kind of fell back on. You know, we always knew that if we didn't have a job, we could go and, you know, do the construction, work with my father, work with family, stuff like that. I mean, I think Ryan has an English degree. Dixie has a resource management degree. Ashley's, Ashley's got a graphics design degree. So, you know, it's kind of one of those things we've always been doing. And same thing, just fell back onto it. And it just, it just worked. Is it surreal? Like that just the thing that you do, the thing you've been doing your whole life. Now people are like, Oh my God, it's that guy. And they know about your sister and your mom and your friends and your kids and your family. Like, is that, you know, you've been doing the show for five seasons, but has that part really sunk in or is it still very odd? It's still very odd, but I think now, especially with our new headquarters, because yeah. people have, we have a, a destination where people come can come and they show up and we, you know, we know they're fans of the show and they see us and they, you know, they get so excited. Whereas we're just walking around doing our thing. It's, <laughs> it's yeah. It, but we're also pretty isolated here in Maine. Right. You know, when we're working on the building season, it's easy just to go to the camps, and just crank and work and kind of block all that out. You know, the film crew will show up periodically through the summer to capture it all. But like you said, we've been doing it five seasons now we've got a good relationship with the film crew. So it's again, that part second nature, but it's when you stop and look up and, you know, we were, we were, we're putting in a tasting room at our headquarters and we were putting in a lawn out back. So Ryan and I out there, sweaty, gross, and, you know, spreading the loam, spreading the grass seed, the hay, all this stuff. And we look up and there's people just standing on the other side of the fence, just taking pictures of us. It's almost like we were in a zoo. <laughs> like, all right, this is strange. And Ryan's like, oh, don't be afraid. Come over. You know, but we're super grateful. We, you know, we'll take pictures with people and stuff, but it, yeah, it still makes us laugh. Well, yeah, because it's like, it's one thing to, you know, become an actor or like mean to get into television or like, you know, I've been hosting shows for 25 years and I did that on purpose. Like I, yeah, saw, yeah, 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 I yeah. went out of my way to do that. But you, but you were famous for just doing the thing that you do for basically just living your life the way that you live it. And that's, that like there's that's it which is such strange because there's no real separation it's just like we're working sometimes there's cameras here and now now people know who we are yeah but i think that's also you know i think that was part of the appeal as well you know i think season one we show up and we're in our grubby work clothes we, you know we work the entire day i mean we're we truly are working on these cabins with right along with all the guys and then it comes time for interview. They're like, oh, do you want to fix your hair? Do you want to do all this stuff? Change your shirt or anything? We're like, no. <laughs> no. Why should we? We're like, Why should we? Yeah. And they're like, no, no, no. We're like, you know, we don't care. I so. always try to map out just the, like the television producer means always trying to map out like, wait a minute. So if they did X number of camps this year and a lot of them span a couple of different seasons and, and I'm also trying to follow your beard growth. And like, all right, before it was summer, the beard was long. Now it's fall. It seems shorter, you know. Well, now there's snow on the ground. Where the fuck did that happen? You know, so <laughs> the no. sort of the timeline, when, when you come in, do, do, is it as linear as, you know, first episode camp, second episode camp, or is there overlap? Are you kind of jumping back and forth? There's a lot of overlap. So last season we did 20, which took us pretty much an entire year. So we'll do them in groups of three or four. Mm-hmm. And up, now we've got probably 15 to 18 guys, girls working with us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Dixie will be leading a crew. Jai will be leading a crew. Ryan will be leading a crew. I'll be running around trying to, you know, keep, keep it all going. And so six to eight weeks is the realistic time frame to get the camps done. But like I said, we've got so many of them going that progress is staggered, you know, depending on how intensive the work is, whether they need some, you know, foundation work, stuff like that. They're constantly overlapping, which, like you said, you can follow it by the progress of the beard. Or I, I follow the progress by seasons by the uh, ex- 
the extreme of my son's mullet. <laughs> <laughs> so season one, he's short hair, and then at some point along the line, he he ended up with a mullet, and you could see the back get longer and longer and longer. And yeah. now he's just got full on long hair, so it's like okay, you can kind of tell exactly by Fletcher's hair. Does it still feel the same in the sense that because have you said like now you have like eighteen people that are sort of working on everything, and so and now you have this headquarters, and it really feels like it feels like you're scaling up. How much how much do you want to scale up, or or have, are you going? No, we still need to keep it intimate and keep the core group, and we can't if we get too big, then it's like then it's a corporation and it's not like a thing. Like, do you, do you ever have those types of internal discussions? Yes, definitely. Um, I think, you know, like I said, season one, when this all started, we did that. We were working together on this one project. We thought it'd be fun. You know, it was just us. Then season one happened. We killed ourselves. I think doing 10 camps in one season, we got up to 20 last season. I think we realized that is the, peak of the amount we can take on in one right. season without stressing ourselves too thin because we still have to make create enough content for the show and if we're spread too thin we're not able to capture all the moments the film crew has a hard time keeping up with us so i think we have kind of figured out what the balance is as far as renovation projects it'd be great to take on some outside projects not for the show mm-hmm. but we haven't hit that point yet also because just it's hard to find skilled or unskilled people who want to get into trades. Right. You know, especially up in this area and especially with everything going on with COVID, it's getting a lot tougher. So I think we're, you know, we're kind of finding our middle ground, but it also allows us to kind of take on the headquarter project, you know, do some other stuff on the side that we can still put a little effort into. Yeah. I mean, again, I think the benefit, like what you were talking about before is like, Oh yeah. When we do this sort of one-on-one interviews, you know, we don't change and we are who we are. And I think that's such that's such a great element of the show because sometimes, you know, people come into a show and then they go into television mode or they go into presentation mode. Yep. And the fact that y'all are who y'all are and your friends and family and that it really just feels like, oh, I'm, I'm just hanging out with these people while they're doing this stunning renovation. And by the way, your work is stunning i mean it thank you thank you what you guys do and 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 what ashley is able to do with the design elements to the interior design elements the inventiveness and the creativeness and it's like holy shit they like every sometimes you watch a renovation show and you go okay i i see what the mo is you kind of just see the same thing get recreated over and over and over again and y'all really listen to what the camp wants to be and what you have and that's what it is. And they're all completely unique from each other. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so what sort of the, w- was that, a, was that a, a conscious discussion or is that just the natural dynamic of how y'all work? That really is honestly the natural, like, natural dynamic of how we work together. And it's great that we can bounce ideas off each other, say, okay, how about doing this to this camp? And every camp is so different and unique that – Again, you know, the camp kind of dictates the build, you know, and we say, okay, this one will get a dormer on the front and we'll put a loft in this area because they've got more kids coming, you know, young kids, they're going to need more space to kind of spread out. I'm trying to think of any specific examples, but each camp is so unique that it still is, like I said, we've done over 70. It's still fun and exciting for us to walk into each one do the demo and see what the possibilities of where we can take it are. Um, We all take pride in our work. And I think the final judgment is, will, would we want to stay in these camps? And, you know, almost every camp we finish, we're like, Hey, we would love to stay here. We'd love to have this place. And so that's kind of the, you know, sign that the job is done. And well, people are lucky to have you because it's, (laughs) <laughs> you know, no, nothing against, uh, this is not a dig on contractors in general, but a good contractor is really difficult to find. A good construction team is really hard to find because we've been through this a lot. I have a really great guy that I work with now, but I've been, you know, you go through people where you're like, oh, well, the a plumber was supposed to show up and they just never showed up and we just never heard from them again, you know, or, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, or yeah. they'll just put a toilet in. It was like, why, wait, why did you put it over there? We had a full, like, I don't understand. <laughs> And I, you know, when you, when you are close to a renovation and we, the house that we're in now, we lived here while it was happening, while it was being restored. 
And sort of what we learned is like, when you're really paying attention, about 40% goes wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's like such a high number of that accidentally got tiled. This thing didn't come in. This thing showed up broken. These people didn't show like part of the process is really just getting everyone on the same page. And we're, so for people who do not have the luxury of being able to hire main cabin masters, do you have advice for people to, to find good contractors, good subcontractors, you know, if, if they want to undertake this and also what, what things could they undertake themselves and what things are not smart for them to undertake themselves? Um, I think, well, we, I mean, we learned along the lines the same way. So season one, we were doing everything ourselves and, you know, we were messing around with some electrical, messing around with plumbing. We were doing things how we always had. And season two, people started catching on code enforcement officers like, no, 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 no. Like (laughs) you're not getting away with that anymore. And we realized we have, you know, people watching us now. So we have to be aware of everything we're doing. We have all our permits in place. But assembling a good team, I think, is the best way to go about it. You know, you find somebody you can trust who kind of has the same vision of you as you, and then it'll kind of the pieces will fall into place. And you ha- can't be so rigid, I guess. You know, that's the big thing is you've got to be able to go with the flow. And if you know something happens that you've got to change on the fly, I mean, we're constantly making changes. I don't think any of the guys have worked with a set of plans on any of the projects yet just because, you know, even the best laid plan is going to change. (laughs) Right. Well, and also the camps are so small. Yeah, of course. But the camps are small enough that you're able to do that. Like if, if these were like 10 room houses, you'd have to, like it'd be difficult. hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, and that's the thing too. It's like, it's, it's just a camp and that's kind of our mantra. It's only a camp. It's only a camp. And, you know, as we bring more carpenters in, it's not, we're not dumbing them down. It's just worrying less about, you know, because as a carpenter, you want to, you're proud of your work and you want everything to be perfect. You know, all your angles to line up, but for a camp and for these budgets to work, you have to move quickly and say, okay, make sacrifices. You know, if our top trim is an eighth to a quarter of an inch, to a quarter of an inch off, it's okay. It's right. not you know, it's not the end of the world. If it was a fine, you know, somebody's home, first home, something like that, different story. But these cabins, you know, you jack them up, you get as close as you can to level and you live with it. We're doing one now that a tree fell on, this monster pine tree fell on it and racked everything out, kicked some walls out, but the family didn't want to tear it down. They wanted to save it. And so you get it back as close as you can to square and start from there and say, okay, you know, this is, we've gotten as close as we can. It's not going to be perfect. And that's, but that's part of the charm of it too. It's, you know, it's perfectly imperfect. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, especially cause a lot of these are basically you, you come in and they're like zombie cabins where they're just the floor is, oh, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know, 30 degree angle and there's fucking carpenter ants everywhere. And there's clearly been animals living in it oh. for the past decade. And so, you know, giving, giving it any love is, is good. So I don't, people aren't going to be like, Oh, why isn't that Matt? Like, fuck you. You couldn't even stand in this place 10 yeah, weeks exactly, ago. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I mean, a lot of these people don't even want electricity. Yeah. They're like, no, we don't want electricity and we'll just use an outhouse. Like they don't even, they're not even, it, yeah. they're basically just like shelters. Yeah. Well, a lot of, you know, people will say my biggest wish is just to have windows that open with screens. It's like, yeah. great, we can do that. <laughs> you know, or, or a sink in the bathroom, you know, just the small stuff that are such upgrades for these camps that people have been going to for their entire lives. You know, just it makes all the difference in the world to them. And, you know, it's it's pretty, uh, you know, a lot of them are a lot of them aren't simple fixes. You know, a lot of times we're working in really difficult locations, you know, out on islands and then, you know, winter setting in. No where, power. You got to bring a general no power. Yeah. 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 Where it's tough. The struggle is real. But again, those are fun for us because we're working in beautiful remote locations that, you know, we want to be spending time in anyway. So it works out all around. Just uh, forgive me for not understanding the geography. Is it, are they rivers or is it a lake? Like what's the body of water that surrounds these little islets? So that's the beauty of Maine. I mean, we have oceans, we have rivers, we have lakes, we have ponds, we have streams, we've got mountains. There's just so many different beautiful areas of Maine that, you know, you can go down to the coast and be on an island or be on a little 
you know, an old clamming shack or fishing lobster shack right on the water. You go up into the mountains and it's totally isolated with a beautiful view, you know, overlooking the presidentials or, you know, you're on a pond close by home that again, you know, it's just a, a little spot you've always gone to. There's just so many different areas. And that, I mean, that's the beauty of working in Maine. You know, we never have to leave the area because there's no shortage of projects. Well, and because I, I'm, I'm thinking about, because I've seen those camps where you basically put like a hand pump sink in and you, and you're, you're pumping water from the, whatever the body of water is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my first thought is like, is that sanitary? Can you do that? Like how is the water clean enough to just like use in your kitchen? I mean, you, people do. Yeah. It's clean enough to use, you know, not to drink obviously, but you know, if you want running water, just enough to wash your dishes, stuff like that, wash your hands. It's totally doable. Um, yeah, I mean, you can put filtration systems in my mother just recently in her own house had been pulling water from the stream for years and finally put it well, well in, but you know, you just, you learn to live with that type of stuff. Oh man. Um, my other question I have, uh, is, is Lance okay? Cause we haven't been able to track him on the internet just for people yes. who read, Lance was on the first season, maybe two of the show and then got married and I think was going to have a baby and then just disappeared. And Lydia looked up, she goes, I can't, I don't know where Lance is. I can't track him. I go, he doesn't seem like someone who has social media. So I don't, he probably is just yes. raising his family somewhere in the woods. Well, you pretty much hit it on the head. Lance is a, you know, great guy, super character, but also a very private person. Um, season one, he was dairy farming. Mm -hmm. So in the morning he would get up, do chores on the farm, come work with us. And then at night go home and do chores. And I mean, it's hard, hard work. The, the opportunity presented itself for him to take over the farm. And that's what he wanted to do. And, you know, he got married, he was having kids. So it was just a perfect, perfect transition for him. And he got to go back to his, you know, solitary private life. And he is now uh, raising cattle, raising dairy cattle. And he has, five emus now which <laughs> you know the, his wife loved them and he didn't yeah. want them no he didn't want them but his wife secretly wanted them and I that mean, they're basically dinosaurs you're basically raising dinosaurs yeah so that was probably that's probably one of the most outrageous stories of my uh, from doing cabin masters is getting these emus and we had them in the back of Ashley's Subaru, transporting them there. We got them on site, and one of them got loose. And we must have spent four hours running through the woods behind his house, trying to catch this emu. And at one point, like, truly just running, like, chasing it, trying to corner it. And at one point, I just stopped. It was, like, six in the morning. And I was like, what are we doing? Like, why on earth? We ended up having to film the whole scene with only one emu. And Lily, Lance's wife, was so upset because there was only one. She knew they lived in pairs, but we couldn't tell her there was one in the woods lost because that would have ruined everything. <laughs> so after we filmed everything, we went back out in the woods. Lance and I finally caught it, got it back, got them back together. But by then it was too late that, you know, we had filmed everything. You so. already shot it. So there were oh, yeah, two. Yeah. Now, they're, now they're, he's upgraded to five emus. Yeah, but just running through the woods, just chasing this emu it was like, oh my gosh. What, <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> yeah. Is this really TV worthy? <laughs> well, apparently it is. <laughs> my, my other like super fan Cabin Masters question is, what is Ivory Jacks? What is it? It's a sweatshirt that I've seen. It, I've seen a, I feel like I've seen a couple different ones, but maybe it's the same one. And every time Lydia and I are like, what is Ivory Jacks? Is that a restaurant? It's in Alaska somewhere. What is it's it? It's a bar in Fairbanks, Alaska. And my, one of my cousins is up in Alaska. He sent me the sweatshirt. It's funny that it's got on the sleeve free parking. And, yes. you know, I'm just... <laughs> Because because we're trying, you know, like, as we get to know you in the show with all these episodes, you know, we kind of notice things. We're like, all yeah. right, Ryan's a fish fan. That tracks, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, like yeah. it, we're just trying to get to know y'all as we're kind of like deep diving. And so, but Ivory Jacks is the one we just couldn't figure out. Like, does he know someone there? Is it is like, does he own that bar? Like what? Because you, you can't normally wear logos on television shows. So, right, 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 right. and so yeah. when you can, it usually like has some connection or something. And so I just couldn't figure out what it was. 
And again, honestly, it's back to that not really caring what we're wearing. Nine times out of 10, if I have to put something on, I just go to my truck, pull out the first thing and throw it on. And that sweatshirt seems to stick around <laughs> you, pretty you strongly. Could sell, you should sell Ivory Jack sweatshirts in your truck. <laughs> I swear to God, you would sell them. <laughs> free parking on the side. You think Ivory Jack's not going to give a shit? You're just giving free promotion. Right, right. Absolutely. Ivory Jack's absolutely. a fair absolutely. basket. I would I would just pitch that to you and consider selling them because I promise you people would buy them. Um, oh, that's how do you uh, just being a team leader is a whole different job description because to just be you know to to be a carpenter and you have like one you you're figuring out what you have to do to pro- but as the team leader you have to do your job and make sure you're effectively managing the team so that everyone's moving in the same direction. Was that was that sort of a natural fit for you, or did you did did that evolve over the past few years? I, it's definitely evolved. Um, I think the biggest thing is just learning what to stress out about and what you can just let go. Um, I think season one. I mean, season one, we really didn't know anything about. You know, we knew how we were building. But to then throw the camera crew, the production schedule, all that on top of things and try and get all this work done, but also make TV because we didn't really know any. We, I mean, we knew nothing about t- the TV side of things, like what the film crew needed for their storyline. And it was super stressful. But over the seasons, I mean, again, it's all about having a good team. You know, the production team is amazing. We work so well together now. They know what they're looking for. They know if they just leave us alone, they're most likely to get more than what they need content-wise. We've got a great plumber. You know, Ryan, is. you know, we work super close together. And it's just, like I said, learning what to stress out about, what you can just let go. You know, knowing that there's 10 different ways to get, there's 10 different ways to hang a door. Mm-hmm. And there's no one right way. So if it's not the way I do it, who cares? As long as the door is hung and it's going to work properly, you know, that's kind of important throughout. That makes a lot of sense because anyone who's been through a couple of different subcontractors, they almost all come in and criticize the pre who did this. I don't know. Why'd they put this over here? I have no idea. You yeah. know, can you, yeah. can you fix yeah. it? I mean, I guess, but I don't know why this guy, this shouldn't be in the fucking wall. This should be out in the thing. Why do they put it? And you're like, I, I literally don't know. That's why I called you. And then another guy would show up and then say that what that guy did was wrong. And so you just, yeah. you know, for consumers, for just like, you know, average folk who don't really understand any of this, how do you know what to believe? How do you know when you're getting fleeced by someone? How do you know when you talked about like pick good people before, how do you know when you're picking good people? Well, I think that's like, I tell all the guys, I tell the young people as well. If you can explain to me why you did this and it's a legitimate reason, not just because that's, you know, because I just did it, but if you can back up why you did it, then there's a reasoning behind it. And it, you know, it makes sense. It's done. And then you, I know that that person can explain, explain it to the plumber or whoever asked the question, why is this like this? Right. They're not, you know, they're not just like, and I guess that might be one of the benefits of not, of working without a set of plans. Because they have, you know, there's a lot of thinking and making decisions on the fly. And that's kind of really what it's all about is being able to say, okay, we have this window, we have this wall, where is it going to make the most sense to put this window versus just slapping it in and going? Because right. that, again, it's, and it's all about thinking practically and economically. Say, okay, if there's a pile of lumber out there, if I'm going to go and cut up, you know, what I need for measurements, I'm not just going to pull a brand new eight foot two by four off the pile. Every time I'm going to keep those shorter pieces. And if I have shorter cuts, I'll use, you know, you think it sounds pretty straightforward and simple, but when you have piles and piles of pine, you know, you start burning through them. It's like, okay, if if we can make sense of it and work efficiently and economically, it's going to help stretch that budget. And that's kind of, you know, what I tried, what we all try, you know, we're all a team. We all try and teach each other and keep open communication so that we all know we're all on the same page. Well, there's, there's also that, that, um, that sort of like, uh, D, I mean, it makes sense that it was DIY network because it, it, there is a real crafty element. And especially with Ashley going off to all these different artisans and be like, Oh, I learned how to pour, 
epoxy into this thing and make a tabletop or like craft this. Like they're, I mean, not that any of the stuff is easy to do, but when you watch it, you go, oh, I can see that is achievable. I can understand how they did that. That was very creative and crafty to just make the kitchen countertop. They just poured resin over some, you know, wood, wood cylinders yeah, or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow, that's something I could do. I totally, I mean, I probably really couldn't in reality. You guys make it look easy, but it seems achievable. Well, we make it look easy, but I guess that's the, that's the magic side of TV is that, you know, you, we, they don't show the mess ups or they don't get in close detail where those, like those cookies is a perfect example Halfway through the project, they started floating back up off the <laughs> wood. You know, so we're like poking them down in, trying to get them down. So, you know, a lot of them are wonky. They're not right on. But we have that luxury that it's just a cabin. Whereas, you know, if you're trying to do this for your own house where you have to work with it every day, you know, I could see how it would get a little, little more uh, tense and not, you know, in trying to make everything perfect. Yeah, but that's like, that's again, that's a great... That's another great life metaphor is like when you're not precious about something, it frees you up to, to it, it, it sort of takes the perfectionism out of the equation, which is a dangerous ideal anyway. And it just frees you up to be creative and go, you know what, this is, it came out how it came out. And it's yeah, 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 yeah. You know, not that it has to be shitty. I just mean like, it's good enough in the sense of like, it, it, it came together in the way that it came together and we accept this for what it is. Exactly. Uh, what is it? Yeah. Wabi Sabi, I think it is the, the perfectly imperfect. You know, you use quality materials, you do quality work. If you don't, I mean, you can strive for perfection, but don't get stressed out if you don't get it. Yeah. Um, Ryan and Ashley over the course of these seasons have built their own house. And it's so funny because it's the, you know, it's, Ryan's always, it's the one house he's going to build. They're going to live in it forever. And he was just the opposite. I mean, everything was perfect, all his <laughs> corner, like all this stuff. And he would come, you know, work on that at nights on weekends and then come working on the cabins. He's like, oh, this is so relaxing. Just not having to stress out about, you know, every perfect miter cut and right. stuff like that. Yeah. So, and, we we man, like man. when, like, we kind of like when tile, I mean, some, some tile, some tile is meant to be laid, you know, mathematically and perfectly. And then there's other tile, like, you know, tile that looks like it was sort of handmade where you want it. You don't want it perfect because it's yeah. more interesting when it, you don't want it sloppy, but it's just, it looks better when it's not, when it doesn't look like a grid, when it sort yeah. of looks yeah. like a person did this. And that's yep. part of the story of that. And, and it is formed this sort of unique entity because of like what you said, it's, it's, it's imperfections and, but that's what makes it, perfect in a weird sort of way oh yeah 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 you know these camps where you walk in and you know the door sticks and everybody knows you've got to like lift the handle that's that type of stuff it's just these little imperfections that are quirks that people grow to love and that's where it's i mean it really is a level of trust between us and the camp owners because they do hand us the key and then we go in and we are I guess responsible for, you know, taking care of and preserving these places that the families just feel so attached to, you know, that's some situations. And then other ones we go into where the families just recently purchased it. They hand us the keys. They say, have, you know, we don't care what you do to it, which is wonderful as well. And then occasionally we'll get to do these projects, you know, where they're almost fully completed and, you know, we just take them to that finish line and again, it's all kind of just to keep it creative and keep it interesting for us as well and keep a good variety. Yeah, I mean, it's, but you're, the, the main sort of guiding principle is, I guess it's sort of really a confluence of what, what do you have? What are you able to do? What can you do with the time that you have in the budget? But also just getting an understanding of who the family is or who the people are, who own the camp and trying yes. to figure out, you know, like the guiding principle is really like, what's their story and how can we, how can we make this an expression of who these people are so that it perfectly suits them? And that's a really interesting way to, to holistically approach as well, because everything always kind of ties back to the story of the family and yes. whatever that camp means to them. And, and that's a great place to come from because it, it just makes it unique and special and also very artistic and expressive because it's, 
you're not just putting wood on a wall. It's all about something and it's about them. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, when, so usually typically at the reveals, it's Ashley and I, and you know, it's just chaos the day before just trying to get everything done. And then when it's Ashley and I standing there ready to hand the keys back, we we still get nervous on every one just because we're so worried that, you know, that it's, it is what they had hoped for and that they're going to love it. But that, I mean, that is ultimately what it boils down to is the camp needs to be usable and fit the family so that it keeps getting used because that's probably the biggest killer of, you know, camps and stuff is when they, you know, it doesn't fit the family's need. It stops getting used and then maintenance drops and then the camp kind of just falls by the wayside. And you work pretty much year round because it it seems like, uh, you know, there's episodes where it looks like it's 90 degrees outside and you guys jump in the lake. And then there's episodes where you're having to scrape frost off the beams so that you can start laying the roofing on. Do you have a season preference or is it all the same? Um, I think, no, winter is definitely hard. Like <laughs> it, it, it's a struggle. It's awful. Um, we lucked out this past winter. It was a milder winter, but if we could, you know, if we can get a project where we're inside doing work, that's fantastic. But late fall is ideal building time. You know, when the days, nights are cool, there's no bugs, you know, you, you work in a sweatshirt. If it's nice out, you're down to a t-shirt. Um, this time of year, it's, it's great. Days are long, but it, you know, tends to be a little bit more muggy. I remember one season winter came, winter set in like right before Thanksgiving, which is, you know, I mean, get a little colder before Thanksgiving, but there was six inches of ice and it just snuck up on us. We were heating up paint cans on the wood stove in order to get it up to temperature because we knew we had like a three hour window to get the paint on the trim before the reveal. And we're like, we have to get this on. Like, you know, it has to happen. So, you know, right when the sun was at its peak, shining, got up to about 50 degrees, we're like, all right, we've got it. Ice had melted. We were painting it on and just, boom, got it done. But, you know, it's probably not the most, <laughs> not, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend doing every cabin that way, but, you know, you do what you got to do. And do, do you, um, uh, has there been, has there, have there, have there been things where you, you know, something that you haven't done yet that you really want to do or something that you tried to do once and they were like, this is, we just can't, we just don't have the time or the elements are working against us. How often do you have to pivot? I'd say every camp we run into that issue. Like right now on a, one we're doing, we had hoped we were do, framing up a gabled end overlooking the water we had wanted to get beautiful triangle windows, mm -hmm. you know, to put in that. Um, and so we finally got to that point. We were ready to order them. And the lead time is over five weeks. Oh. You know, just because this everything, it's busy season for everybody. And with COVID, supply chains are getting interrupted. So we're like, there's no way in heck we're going to be able to buy brand new triangle windows. So then we're like, all right, we'll see if we can find used ones anywhere. And same thing that just weren't found. So we ended up going with two square, perfectly square windows just on a bias so that they become diamonds, you know, and it's like, oh, wow, which, you know, works great. But again, it's just that, you know, kind of just creative thinking, figuring, okay, what's going to work? What's going to get it done? And, but that also gives just a, a unique and creative look to the camp that, you know, normally, it, you know, might not have had otherwise. How so are you constantly. finding? How are you finding the balance of elements? I mean, like the balance of the design elements, because there really is a. I, I I used to be very sort of cookie cutter in the sense of like, oh, if I'm working on a Spanish house, everything needs to be Spanish in it. And my wife is very much like, that's not necessarily true. You need to find what speaks to you, and when you incorporate those elements, you are the glue that makes it all work. Now, granted, mm -hmm. she just happens to be very good at that. I can see that going super sideways and all of a sudden it just looks like a fucking junkyard. And we're working on a place on a property right now where I, I there was this uh, renovation show on Apple of these, just these like stunning homes around the, the world. And I got really into this Japanese Yakisugi wood where they burn the wood. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And, it, and the wood has this really incredible burn to it. And, but it, then it like, it sort of like seals the wood at the same time yeah. through the burn yeah. process and so we're like, okay, it's just like one little room kind of guest 
house. And so we'll do Yakisugi wood on the outside, but then we wanted to do, there's a lot of barrel tile on the rest of the property, but the, because the Yakisugi is black, we went with like a black barrel tile, which I've never seen on a house before. And now we're looking at like Mexican shaped uh, octagon and dot tile, but also in a dark color, like in, in blacks and grays. And so it's very monochromatic. And then on top of that, there's a couple of stained glass windows that are a little English. So it's like Tudor, Spanish, Japanese, <laughs> all these things. And it's not done. We have no idea if it's going to work. So do you have advice when you're like, oh, fuck, we're taking real big swings. How do we balance this so that it doesn't look like a carnival? Yeah, I think that's where Ashley really steps in and pulls everything together on the design side of things. I mean, she's got to deal with, you know, working with all of us guys and me bring, trying, to bring, trying to bring in as much used stuff as I can to help keep the budget down. But she, because we know her so well, and she is not scared of us. She steps in, she, you know, she says no. And, you know, we get in fights all the time, but she holds her own. She's just as stubborn as I am. And she's really good at making sure it all kind of works together. So I think that having somebody to bounce your ideas off, you know, it's great. It's easy to get wrapped up in your own theme, you know, stuff like that. But when you start sharing them with your sister or whoever, they're not scared to say, no, nope, we're not doing it. And well, that's my wife. That's- like she's and she has such a great sense of no, 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 that's not going to work. And this way, like she under she really understands the balance of things. Yeah, but I just yeah, yeah. I know for a lot of people, especially because so many people are at home now and probably tackling rental projects that they've been putting off for so long, or even just looking for stuff to do. So they're fixing shit up around the house, and it's like even just a little bit of advice on a guiding principle of like how do we know what to balance or what to take on or that's too much or we really should hire a professional to do this. Uh, do you have any nuggets of wisdom for people who are experiencing that at the moment? I mean, I say, give it a try. You know, that's, that's how this whole show got started in the first place. You know, a friend of a, a friend of a friend was like, Hey, you should check this out. I made the phone call. We started talking, you know, take the opportunity, try it, try building it. You know, if it doesn't work, you know, call somebody in, but it's, it's carpentry and home building has kind of been taken out of the homeowner realm, you know, by the professionals. But I think there's still a lot of basic skills that you can get into, you know, if you do your research, you, you know, practice that type of stuff. It's, it's all doable. I mean, there are thousands of carpenters across the state of Maine doing the same exact thing we are. We just happen to have a film crew following us around. Um, but, you know, everybody, they all do beautiful work. They all take pride in it. But people can easily pick up the trades. It's not, there's no secret to it, I don't think. It's just hands-on learning as you're going. And just be careful not to uh, cut your fingers off. Yes, yes. Well, <laughs> you know, you can, you know, you see, you, you, you start looking at construction, you start looking at like woodcrafting equipment and you're like, God, I don't, and it's almost like to a lay person, we're almost we don't know what we don't know. And so some things yeah. seem very easy. So it's like, Oh, you might just start buying equipment. Go, oh my God, I'll just lathe my own. And then you get it. You're like, Oh, Oh yeah, this is way beyond what I, I and then the shit just sits in your garage and never, you know, Oh, that, that happens to me still all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go through a catalog. And be like, Oh man, I totally want to get into this. And I get it. I'm like, Oh, this is I can't even put this together. I'm ready for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did you I know, know? <laughs> that's human nature i think but you know yes, basic is. tools it you're good to go <laughs> yeah because you know my wife was like god maybe we could talk them into coming out and helping us with and i go sweetheart they live in maine and there's a <laughs> pandemic the main cabin masters are not coming to Southern California <laughs> to work on a Tudor Japanese Spanish <laughs> cottage <laughs> it's wow. just not gonna happen <laughs> But our people- no, that's the other thing too. It's know your codes. I mean, we work in some areas where, you know, it's the wild west still, and right. we love those areas. But then we get down to other areas where, you know, the national building code applies, and we're like, oh, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, <it's- laughs> so can't uh, can't put yeah. that there. Okay, you know, staircases are one of those things. Like, 
they're frustrating in every single project we do. They're hard to get in. Sometimes we use ship ladders. Sometimes those are allowed. Sometimes they're not. So it's, and every time, also because we're working right on the water, we're dealing with, Maine has strict shoreland zones about what can be built right on the water. Yeah. But every town interprets those laws differently. So, you know, we think we have it figured out. We go into this town and they're like, you can't do that. And we're like, but we just did it in the next town over. They're like, nope, that's not how we do things here. Oh my so gosh. Like, okay. Some of yeah, it I understand is for safety. And some of it just seems arbitrary. Like really? The wood can't just go this way. Really? <laughs> you know, yeah. some things you understand. Another thing is like, did someone just write that down 70 years ago and no one bothered to really think about it again? Is that what happened? And we've all, we've all learned like, no, nope, you can't fight it. You just accept it Let and it move go. on. It's not worth it. You know, it's not going to go anywhere fighting it. So we're incorporating something that we saw on your show in this cottage that we're working on, which is we're getting this like wide plank, knotty wood. Yeah. We're in the center of one part of the room. We're doing 45 degree angles. And then on the ceiling and the walls, we're doing straight horizontal planks. And yeah, 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 yeah. The first time I, the first time I really noticed it was you were renovating this it was like this historic fishing camp that was, uh, and you had to fight the tide coming in. And oh yes, 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 yes. That place was amazing, and you put like a fish thing on it outside. Yes, and upstairs yes. the walls had this really crazy wood, and and I've seen you guys do that in other camps where you angle the wood on one wall and then it's straight on the rest of the walls, and it just yeah, yeah, yeah. A great simple focal point for the room. And that's what it's all about, too, is just kind of breaking it up because we live in a state where eastern white pine, it's everywhere and it's great material to build with. And so same thing. We'll just exactly what you said. Try it different ways, paint it white, stain it different colors, but we'll buy flats of it and use it for everything. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll start from the bottom, use it for our sheathing boards, um, up to our wall boards, to our trim. And, you know, we just burn through these piles. And the other beautiful thing is at the end of the day, you have piles of scrap wood that you know you can burn in your burn barrel and you know take home and use for more which is great and that's you know other one other thing we really strongly believe in is using as much real natural product as possible because the environmental impact you know it's not the pvc boards that your scrap ends are going to end up in a landfill or you know when you're cutting them you're breathing in the plastics and all that stuff we i mean they they definitely have their place and we use them, we do use some of them, but for the most part, we try and use, because we go into these 100-year-old camps, and they're built with all real wood, and that's why they're still standing, is because they can handle the environment, the moisture, all that stuff, and so we, you know, stick with what works. And yeah, again, it, it is kind of funny to see those camps where you, or you go, and they go, yeah, my uh, grandfather, you know, built this camp with his fishing buddies, and you, and you guys look at the foundation and go, I mean, I don't entirely understand how it's standing, but it's solid, so I guess it's fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. We did one, and you could tell that it was just the guy and his drinking buddies because the writing on the wall, you could tell when it was Friday night or Saturday night because it just got more and more obscene. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that. Video. It was so funny, but it's so much fun to kind of peel back and discover the history of these places. Because it is, you know, that's what it is. People just going up and working on them when they can. Or just, you know, they're built well to start. Finding shit hidden in the walls, old posters or records or whatever. That that one that was the uh, on the tide, the clamming shack, that was by far the grossest smelling camp we have ever worked on. Because it it was an old clam processing facility. And they had concrete on the floor and then two inches of cork on the walls, ceilings, everything. Ugh. So at the end of the day, processing and clams, they would just hose it all down, you know, get rid of it. But as the, you know, as the concrete would crack, all those juices, everything would seep <laughs> down through into the floor. And then it was closed up for like 15 years with no usage. The animals lived in there and they just stunk <laughs> it up. I mean, the smell was horrifying. And, you know, we all we say if there was smell vision, it would have grossed everybody out, but. Yeah, but what you did with that place was, I mean, that place was stunning by the time they went. I can't remember, was it a, uh, I've seen a lot of like cool recycled canoe stuff, but there was some sort of a, 
Or, or no, maybe it was a hoist. You you built a hoist on that one. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. Their wine in the river. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It hoisted <laughs> up at the end. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one, That I think that's what all of our, one of our favorite. That was just, like I said, it was such a, tr- such a transformation. I think we used, you know, shellac the interior like three or four times to try and seal in the smell. And, you know, I think we got it for the most part, but it was... <laughs> It was something else. It, it, they still, even as nice as it was by the end, it's someone would be like, do you smell? Like, it's, that, I don't know how you get rid of that. a little in here. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little, you know, there's a little, we're just, there's a little bit of clam haunt. There's just a little bit of, we're just constantly, just, you yeah. just can't, I don't, you can't get that out of the bones of the place, but you know. Not, you never, know. ever, ever. But it, again, it just adds to the whole mystique and the character of the place. Did you, um, uh, my my condolences on your dad. I, I lost my dad a handful of years ago too. I I understand I understand it, and I and I hope was 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 he able to was he alive when the show started? Did he ever see what you were working on? He was not. He um passed away. I want to say the summer before, and then kind of that winter, the the seed got planted and the talk started. So he never he never got to witness the whole process or anything of it, but he would have been right there in the. I mean, he was something. He was something else. He would have been right there in the thick of it. He was the guy who would, I mean, be cleaning the to- the nastiest, most disgusting toilet to get it usable again, and then instantly go from cleaning it with his bare hands, turning and grabbing a box of Cheez-Its and just popping them <laughs> in his mouth like. <laughs> Not, nothing phased him, and I, he would have been. He would have loved everything we're doing. <laughs> he probably would have stolen the show on his own, but he's definitely uh, still with us, part of it. That's, that's sure. nice. And and I also, I wonder if you have some of those moments sometimes where you're doing something and then you realize, like, oh my god, that's my dad. Like, where you you kind of feel it in your hands, yes. like you go, holy shit! It's like, and you really kind of understand, like, this sort of, you know the real, like the DNA and the spiritual DNA of like, Oh my God, that was, I get it now. I totally understand. Oh what yeah. Life absolutely. Is. Yeah. We always called him the human crow because he would always collect shiny things like, you know, just little trinkets here and there. And sometimes at the end of the day, I come home and I'll empty my pockets and I'll have collected, you know, wire nuts, screws, dip, you know, hooks <laughs> from cabinets and just dumping my pockets out. I'm like, all right, you know, but stuff that I'll save and, you know, I used a, pile of wire nuts today on a camp that we just need to cover up some wires and i'm like right 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 now i get it that's why he was uh collecting everything setting it aside now i understand the crow because you did the, that that camp for your mom where you put the crow yes in the, yes that yes. makes sense now okay now yeah. i totally understand I, I like i love the backstory i love the super <laughs> fan backstory yeah, yeah, um yeah. I uh, oh I guess we're at about an hour this is like a therapy session we're in an hour <laughs> but um uh uh, is there so it sounds like you're making more yes we are so we started on season five a month ago yeah so everything was kind of put on hold for so many different reasons we weren't sure what network we were going to end up with they kind of passed us around you know diy the new magnolia network just uh hgtv but with everything that's going on the diy transition to magnolia got pushed back so mm-hmm. Right now, we are, it sounds like we're going to be airing the new episodes, 10 new seasons on the DIY network. Got it. Um, And then eventually that will change over. But yeah, so we are on our first round of camps right now. You know, it's it's another great group. We're sticking close to home before we would travel like two to three hours away. But we're doing everything within an hour just to make it easier on everybody. Um, You know, allows us to focus on our headquarters in Manchester. We're putting in, like I said, putting in a tasting room there to feature main beers, wines. Um, we've got the merchandise retail store. We're doing our own podcast in headquarters as well called From the Woodshed. Oh, my God. That's fantastic. Is it yeah, all of you? Yeah, yeah. No, it's just Ryan and I just shooting the shit. You know, we have guests on. We'll have Ashley. We've had a bunch of people on. So it's fun. Oh just my God, that's great. All these different outlets now. So as a fan, I really want to get like what is Jedi's story? That guy is so mysterious to me because first of all, he has a great nerd's name. He's Jedi, but yeah, you, right? <laughs> you showed a picture of his high school and he's like, he played football, you know, like he was a yeah. jock. 
And he oh yeah, no, 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 hockey, football, and then we found out the other day he did pole vaulting in high school. So like, <laughs> yeah, but he, you know, we have him as a guest. We have Dixie as a guest. So if, you know, if you want to find out more about all these guys, check it out. I a thousand percent do because it yeah. again. We have Doug, our plumber, who I mean, Doug could have his own show. He's just an unbelievable guy. Is that the guy? I know, I know, Doug the plumber. Is that the same guy, or is there a different? There's a guy that was like one of your dad's best friends. Who that was? That was, that was another guy, Wild Bill. Yes, another, another old time Mainer. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So like said, we've got a great team going for us this year. We got some young guys. Um, knock on wood, everything's going smoothly. We should, uh, yeah, we should hopefully not go too late. Hopefully, we don't go into the new year. We can get it wrapped up before that, but. Yeah. What do you what do you envision? Like this this you know life has life has kind of handed you this amazing curveball, and now you know five years in, you have this like industry you know, and this show and and it's it do do you envision it going somewhere? Do you just take it day to day, or do you plan that far in the future? Do you have like a vision, or is it just like well we'll just kind of see where we end up? I think we kind of are approaching it the same way you approach the cabins it's like we we it's amazing to sit back and see how it's grown but we're gonna allow it to keep growing however it kind of you know we we've tried to do some things that haven't panned out but you know the retail space and then the bar and you know just we'll kind of let it take us where it wants to and we know it's not gonna last forever so we've always said if we're you know as long as we're having fun what we're doing we'll keep doing it um i think we'd be doing this. We'd be building the cabins, working on the cabins with or without a film crew. I think we all still enjoy it. I, you know, we can get more young guys going in it. Great. It's getting, you know, it's getting a little more, you know, swinging the hammers kind of wearing down, you know, can't swing the hammer quite as long in the day, but that's what the young guys are for. So, yeah, but it's, but it's, you know, there's just so much great, there's so many great things to extrapolate from it. You know, like, like I've said, it's like, using what you're working with you using yep. what you can yep. you know like recycling what you can embracing the imperfection the sort of the bonds of friendship and the bonds of family and like all that stuff i mean and and also just again a, a skill set that involves like listen if there if there were an apocalypse if there were a walking dead style apocalypse y'all would be in real good shape because you know how to build stuff you can live without electricity and running water probably and do fine you know, like I'm sure, I'm sure there are hunters in the group. Like you, you, you yeah, hunters, fishers. Yeah, so I, Maine is really the place to be for you know for an apocalypse. It seems like that's what we think. That's why we're here. <laughs> that's why it's Maine Cabin Masters and not New Hampshire Cabin Masters or anything like that. We're <laughs> we're not going anywhere, and I think that's exactly it. We're not going anywhere. You know, there's no shortage of cabins and camps. We all have our own places that constantly need maintenance. You know, we love it and we, we know how fortunate we are. Like, this is such a amazing experience. You know, it's same thing with my family. We try and just not take it for granted. I remind them constantly, this isn't normal. You know, we just, <laughs> <laughs> just show up home riding the school bus with a film crew waiting for you. It's, it's not normal. But one of our biggest compliments is that when, you know, families come up to us, say, hey, this is a show that we can all sit down and watch together. Yeah. You know, that's, I mean, that's what we look for. And, you know, it is, it's a great compliment for us as well. And then sort of lastly, well, I guess two things. Number one, how does your brain problem solve? I would love to hear how you problem solve a little bit, <laughs> just in terms of, you know, because you you are every, every time you do one of these, I'm sure it seems like, how the fuck are we going to, you know, it's like, there must be that moment of, okay, how do we do this? Is it, is it just a, a, a question of like breaking things into smaller achievable chunks like how do you start problem solving in seemingly unsolvable situations sure sure um i think you know so we go into the camps we do the demo and we we do we strip it back as far as we possibly can to get down to the bones to kind of see how it has evolved Mm -hmm. i mean it kind of is deconstruction you know you deconstruct it down and then your mind you say okay what what's the path of least resistance to get where we need to be. And there, there's always, there's always a solution, you know, and that's, I think be part of the solution, not the problem. 
at saying, okay, what, what is it going to take to get back to here? And at this point, you know, all the guys are so, everybody on the crew is so, has so much experience before when, you know, we'd run into a rotted sill, it would just, everything would come to a standstill. And, you know, the few of us who had experience would come in, show the guys, you know, be like work with them to get the beams replaced, that type of stuff. But at this point now, all the guys know exactly what tools they need to do, get in, get it done so that we can start rebuilding it. And yeah, you kind of just look at it as a, like you said, take the holistic approach, say, okay, what is most important to the family? What's going to make this most functional and usable for the family and try and build off of that. And then lastly, what are you, what are you really, um, what are you hopeful about right now? Like, what are you joyful about? Like what really, what really, it doesn't even have to be this. It can be anything. Like, is there, is there any kind of thing that sort of the spark that kind of keeps you going that you get excited about? Um, yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I've got four kids, two teenage girls, well, 13 and 14. They keep things pretty real for me. Yep. <laughs> um, but just spending time with family is huge for me. Um, getting up to camp, you know, being able to enjoy this beautiful state. And also, yeah, just I've seen the young people kind of take an interest in this. I mean, we have a very unique platform where we can show off our state. We can show off that, you know, it's okay to be an electrician. You know, it's okay to be a carpenter. You don't have to, you know, it, it's a decent, honest living. And if, you know, we can get some kids inspired that way, then job done, I say. I hope you have time to spend at your own camp and, and not just <laughs> creating dreams for other people. <laughs> like, when do they have time to do anything? You know, in between like <laughs> Ryan jumping through walls. Sometimes yeah. I think Ryan thinks that you're making like a Johnny Knoxville show. It's like, I feel like he and in I his mind he is. Age. How the fuck is he not like torn his shoulder? <laughs> he just will jump through a wall. What does he always say? It's better to be lucky. What is it better? Yeah. I can't remember. He's got so many sayings. Something about better to be lucky than perfect or right. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, thank you so much for taking the time. As I said, you know, my wife and I just adore you and your show and everyone on the show. And it's just such a wonderful. And when she said to me yesterday, like, we're all caught up. I was, I get sad. I was like, what do you mean we're caught up? You know, I was like, I was upset because we have oh, watched no. <laughs> every episode, but I feel like we could still go back and experience yeah. them again. Um, well, we, yeah, we are working on more episodes. So good. And if you get, if you get that, check out the podcast, get your uh, fix. If you need Is that to. Is the podcast up now? Yeah. Yeah. Great. From the woodshed. Um, yeah. Check that out. And when things start clearing up, come to Maine, you know, get out here. We definitely will. I mean, I, we, we want to make a pilgrimage to your shop. I mean, there's no question. Um, Give us a shot. I, I, I was just talking to somebody saying how it would be fun to just get some uh, random celebrity guests to just come be part of the crew. Just, you know, not hype it up. Just show up with your hammer and start working with us. And then, Oh my God, I would. Hand across. Yeah. How fun I, would that be? Listen, we're, we're so into that. Like I had to talk my wife out of, she was convinced that she could build a log cabin on our property. I was like, no, you, you can't. I never want to be someone to say like, no, you can't do that. But I was like, sweetheart, All right. you physically can't build a log cabin by yourself. I could do it. I love you. I really don't know if you really understand, you know, and honestly, I'll bet I'm wrong I'll, because she is, she is very determined and she's very resourceful. Right, right, right. She'll just do it to prove you wrong. We will come and, and she will, she will be like a star, uh, uh, worker on your team you will you will let me go without a, you will want to keep her on your staff i promise you she's really <laughs> we'll good. keep her around and you'll be off with ashley doing the design stuff yeah yeah yeah. i'll go and figure out how to like carve an owl out of a out of yeah, a yeah, yeah. Perfect, perfect, perfect perfect yeah i'm good with that um chase right. thank you so 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 much i really appreciate it before we hang up i'll give you my information we'll stay in touch and if we ever come okay. out to maine then uh i would love that Absolutely. Absolutely. Now I'll just say the end. ID 10T scanning complete. Enjoy your burrito.